This is Cinema Activist, the official podcast of Lion's Den Productions for filmmakers and cinephiles who crave context. In this episode, my guest is Justin McConnell, the filmmaker behind the new documentary Clapboard Jungle. Buckle up on this one. We're going to dive into the challenges of financing and selling your independent film. After watching your documentary, every painful moment of your documentary, I do feel like I know I know your story and I know your struggle. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when we were shooting it, that was the full title uh, since it's been released. It, I, it was just cut down to Clapboard Jungle, but uh, IMDb wouldn't let me change the title. So they've set exactly what the title is at this point. So either one of those works, you'll find the movie that way. Well, so you're um, a Canadian-based filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Give me a little bit of your background. Did you always have an interest in the arts when you were growing up? Did you gravitate to the arts? Yeah, I mean, I, I always was very interested in, in art, artistic pursuits of any kind of kind of way, but uh, I would say that the film thing didn't really hit me until I was about 15. Before that, you know, I did what kids do. Uh, you know, I, I, I had extravagant games in my head that I would play with toys and stuff like that, or, um, you know, you know, I'd write short stories, handwrite, written out in pen and stuff like that, and make my own little tiny books. I was always sort of writing as a kid, but up until I was 15, I was more thinking I was going to want to be like a criminologist or a, or a oh, paleontologist. Wow. <laughs> um, and it's right in the movie too. It's, it was literally me realizing, no, I actually just really like Jurassic Park and Silence of the Lambs and movies. Uh, so maybe I'll do that. And it, I started making documentaries uh, using two VCRs, editing back and forth between two oh, VCRs yes. for class uh, on, on various subjects and for class presentations and that, uh, kind of gave me the bug to think, okay, maybe I can do this. Uh, so I made a bunch of little short films and fun stuff. And my first feature in high school, uh, again, editing with two VCRs and patching audio by pulling RCA cables out of one unit, plugging it into the other to do the sound design. <laughs> because, you know, it was the 90s and uh, there wasn't really a lot of uh, access to digital editing systems for, um, right. for low, like people who didn't really have any money and weren't, you know, weren't professionally working in the industry. So you just work with what you can work with. And then I moved to Toronto in uh, the year 2000, uh, initially to go to film school at York University. Uh, But there was a TA strike and I realized I didn't like the program because it was way too theoretical and film history based, even though it was a production program. Hmm. Uh, I didn't think I was getting any real uh, practical knowledge out of it. So I dropped out of York because of the TA strike, went home for a bit, came back to Toronto in 2001 and went to Travis Institute, which is like a much more technical based uh, post-production program I took. And then out of school, I started working as like a uh, an editor, producer, director of uh, TV spots for a bunch of record labels. So like in the early 2000s, there would be TV spots for like Seal's album or, you know, Billy Talent or whatever. You get like a commercial with their music video cut into like 30 seconds and the pack shot flies in. I, that's what I was making for like three or four years in the early 2000s. And then I branched out to music videos on my own with my own company, Unstable Ground, uh, started doing live concerts. And then uh, made my first properly distributed feature documentary with working class rock star shot between like 2004 and 2006, kind of just paid for it in my own pocket with whatever client money I could bring in basically. And then it just sort of built from there. I've made, you know, I made my first narrative, well, second narrative feature, but the first one with any kind of real impact uh, was shot in 2010 for $40,000. Uh, and sold to Anchor Bay in three territories and Lionsgate in the UK. And that kind of, I guess, gave me a little bit of the confidence that I think I could do this. Um, but it's been a bumpy road the whole way, right? You know, I've, I've made money. I've been condo to money. I've, I've been up and down and <laughs> all over the place. And I think I am, um, I don't want to make the mistake of calling myself like a self-made filmmaker, even though I've worked very hard to kind of, um, do as much as I can myself because that nobody else is really giving me the opportunities. But I'll, I'll say right off the bat that like in the early 2000s and stuff, 
you know, I, I for the collapse in particular, that forty thousand dollars was like a loan I borrowed from my parents, uh, from because they they had owned a driving range business and had a little bit of extra money. This is your your second feature that you're talking about. Well, it's the first feature that wasn't something I shot in high school on a handy cam. Yeah, yeah. So your first, uh, let's say, professional. Yeah. Thing? Well, the first thing where I had to pay crew and I shot on a red and I had like a, it, it was intended to be made for like um, the market. Cause what had happened was in 2009, I went to AFM for the first time with a project called the eternal, which was like a bigger film. Um, and I had actually gotten halfway to $3 million, but I, I came to the realization that, you know, I had gotten zero track record aside from some short films and, um, I needed something to prove that I could make something. And everybody was like, well, they're not going to let you make a feature until you've made a feature. So the idea was, okay, I'll try and borrow money either from family or I'll run up some credit cards or something. And I'll, I'll just get the, whatever the smallest amount of money I can put together, I can do to make a professional enough looking movie. I'll do that. So I, uh, I, have been, I basically borrowed for a year. I borrowed 40 grand off my parents, mm-hmm. um, which was not easy to convince because we're yeah. not, and I don't come from a rich family or anything like that. It was, it was very much like, we're going to trust you with this, but um, you're paying back every fucking penny kind mm-hmm. of thing. And, uh, and I made the movie and I shot it for that amount. And then I, I took it to AFM in 2010 and that's where Raven Banner signed it on. They sold the, the rough cut to Japan that gave me enough money to finish the post-production. And then each little new territory that sold gave me enough money to sort of pay out the deferrals. And eventually it made more than two and a half times its money back. But this was also when the market was significantly healthier. So a small movie like that actually went to Walmart and Blockbuster and stuff like that. So there was serious money being made. It's not quite the same anymore. That was before, yeah, the the big crash in like what oh eight. That was what why Eternal didn't get moving was because you know the the two thousand nine the the market crash and all of our investors were like, well, we don't know our future, so we can't do this right now. And, uh, it just never kind of remounted. Um, but yeah, long story short is, uh, you know, I self-financed some documentaries. I self-financed another feature in 2016. Uh, and it's all just because I've slowly built up a post-production company over the years where I do Blu-ray authoring and DVD authoring and trailers and stuff. And that gives me just enough money to sink little bits of investment into small projects up until the point where I got Life Changer made, which was finally somebody coming to the table like a distributor, a couple distributors coming to the table and going, we're going to put down X amount of money and X amount of money. And the whole movie was paid for before we shot a frame kind of thing. Cause it was actually greenlit by a bunch of companies as opposed to like coming from my pocket or, you know, me dragging my ass to my parents who might say no, because they don't have necessarily have the money. It was, it yeah. was like, you know, that, but I do have to address that. Right. Because there, I, I feel like there is a discrepancy in the film industry where, um, you do get little bits of uh, boosts from other people uh, along the line and it's in varying degrees and it depends on when you came up and who your background is and stuff. And I, 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 I have to address right off the bat that like, yeah, I got a boost. Uh, it, it wasn't like, you know, my parent, I, my parents lived in LA and they, they walked me into a studio and were like, give my kid a director <laughs> job. <laughs> but it was still sort of like on, on a working class sort of level, it was still sort of like, okay, we'll trust you with this, see what you can do. And that could have easily been like me falling flat on my face just as easily. So, so what are, okay. So for the last, let's say decade, like 10 to 12 years, you know, there's been a shift for sure in the industry. There's no longer, you know, the dream that we're all told of come up, come up, come up with an idea, a great script, you're going to make Sundance, uh, you know, somebody's going to buy your film, you know, the, the fantasy. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and since you've been kind of in the industry, you know, at, at different aspects of it for a while now, what are some of like the major things that you've seen change, you know, probably what in the last five, five, six years, would, would you say the biggest ones? I think I have to preface by saying that it, the dream does happen that way for some people, like sure. for a very infinitesimally small number of people who are either incredibly talented to the point where they're almost a genius or they're lucky in their timing, or they've got the right connections at the right time. Uh, that explosion of, of overnight success uh, and your set thing does happen for some people. Um, but that's not the vast majority of people working in film or trying to make films. 
you know, you could beat your head against the wall for decades and, and not break through. And then 30 years into your career, you know, you're, you're suddenly <laughs> all that groundwork that, that you put below you sort of starts to explode and your career moves faster and you get to where you want to be. Um, but I think now the biggest issue that we run into is that there's just so much uh, content. And it's not just that it's affecting the indie people, it's affecting everybody because the it's almost like the medium of film of storytelling is slightly less or even significantly less special as an individual product, as an individual um, piece of art. I, I, I know I just said product and art as if they were equated, but in, in, it is the film business. If you're selling something sure. to an audience, it is a product, no matter if, if it's, you know, an art film from Fassbender or something, it, it's still a product. You know, you're still packaging it for a special edition to sell to an audience. I hate it, but it is what it is. <laughs> so that's the way things are going, unfortunately. I mean, more people want to be YouTubers and content creators than want to be filmmakers at this point. Right. So you, you, you kind of have to ask yourself, what is it you really want to do? You know, and, and, and since there's so many filmmakers out there making so much stuff, and since the technology is so cheap that, you know, you can with a, and I know there was a big, <laughs> there was a big to do about this on Twitter, uh, maybe a month and a half ago or something saying you can't make a film on an iPhone, but you can technically make a film on your mo mobile phone. It may not be a great movie. It may not sell for you, but you can absolutely shoot one and edit it together and have an actual feature film uh, on next to no money at this point. And there's lots of those movies that get made and they flood the marketplace. And then there's mid-level movies that are made by streamers that people talk about for three days and then forget about it for the rest of their entire lifetimes uh, that exist. So between all the streaming platforms vying for dominance over this new streaming space, you know, HBO Max and Disney and all these, they're all producing their own content, which means there's tons of opportunity to get content made from those platforms. But that doesn't necessarily mean your content's going to get made. And on the other end of the spectrum, all the people who are just making movies because they can and because, you know, they just want to put movies together and make uh, make whatever they can and get it at the market. And there's an avenue to get stuff seen now because you can take over your own distribution if you absolutely want to. You know, you can set up a Vimeo OTT account or Vimeo Pro or whatever and sell it directly to people. You can place it on Amazon Prime yourself with caveats. You know, there, you can sell your own Blu-rays and DVDs. You can get it out there yourself between these two ends of the spectrum, there's sort of like a middle ground that doesn't exist like it used to because the path to revenue is much more difficult because there's so much content. So the content that has to, that gets made has to stand out so much it breaks through. So even in the festival scene, you know, for every movie that breaks out and does crazy out of the festival scene and gets properly noticed and gets a really good release and gets great reviews and a great physical release and all this sort of thing. There's probably 99 movies or more that didn't get that, but are still, you know, they, they either didn't get into the right festivals or, you know, they got into some, but they weren't really the talk of the festival. So they kind of just flounder and stumble their way out to a release eventually, you know, and even the ones that are the talk of the festivals, they're not necessarily making their money back depending right. on what the movie is. So it's the whole thing is like this game of roulette now where it's not just you don't just have to have a great product, a great film, a great piece of art. You also have to have the right timing, the right audience demand at the right time, um, the right tastemakers to say the right things at the right time, um, the proper publicity strategy, uh, the fact that, you know, you know, you, you don't have something in your film or somebody involved in your film that gets, you know, backlash against them for any particular reason all of that's kind of got to go right in order for the film to be a success and even when it's a success the platforms and the, the actual distributors are not necessarily paying enough to cover your budget depending on like because you can have a great film that does really well in festivals but maybe uh maybe your sales agent thinks it's worth x amount of dollars but not a, there's not a single distributor on earth that wants to pay that much so you wait and then two years go by and now your film is worth 10% of what it was worth two years ago. So it's way too late, but you got to get it out. So you settle for a lesser deal. And that happens all the time too. So I think it's just the biggest change is that it's not as clear a pipeline to revenue anymore. And because there's so much product vying for the same revenue, a lot of stuff kind of just falls by the wayside. So you have to be prepared to kind of eat a lot of shit mm -hmm. uh, and keep throwing stuff against the wall until something sticks. Yeah, so it's kind of like the good, the good with the bad, right? Because in the old days, 
the point of entry was so expensive yep. um, because, you know, and that's why you didn't see, right, like a lot of diversity in filmmaking, right? It was like you would go to a couple couple different film schools. You'd get in with the in crowd. It's yeah, um, a good old boys club. To some good degree. old boys club. <laughs> I don't think, like, if I... I could lament, oh, my, the dream I had of being a filmmaker isn't the same as if I had to come up in the early 90s and that when the indie scene was moving. But I'll be honest with myself, if I was coming up in the early 90s, there's probably a really good chance I wouldn't have gotten anywhere. Mm-hmm. There was no internet to support an early drive of my career and get my shorts and my films out there and publicized through social media. And and the doors were way more way more closed, essentially. You, it, I, I don't think I could have, like, I, I couldn't, Kevin Smith made it work, which is great, but there's not a lot for every, you know, clerks. There's, there's a, a bunch of indie movies shot for around the same budget that we're not even talking about anymore. And every once right. in a while they, they pop up and especially it's like, Hey, remember this? <laughs> but, um, but there's tons of Sundance titles even that played Sundance and got great accolades that just are, didn't even make it off of VHS. Didn't even make it to VHS. So right. uh, yeah, definitely. It's a, it's, it's a dichotomy. It's like, Yes, of course, there was less films back then, so films seemed more special and they made way more money. Uh, but the barrier for entry was significantly higher than it is now. But now that the barrier for entry is a lot lower, we get more diversity, but there's less revenue. So it it becomes a more of a survival game. Now it's like you have to have such business savvy really needs to be part of it. And maybe, you know, listening to what you were saying, like with the having to have all the planets align just right, it's it's like a bit of luck. To it's luck. Uh, timing. Part of it you can plan to you can plan to not get in your own way at the very least. Like you can you can plan your film in a way that actually appeals to a market uh, enough that and and it ticks enough of the right boxes that you know there it must sell something. And the, the best way to do that is consult with sales agents that regularly have a track record of this. But that still doesn't guarantee it's going to work. It, but you can at least try to make it work by thinking about those things. Whether or not it does is remains to be seen once the film's actually executed and done. But yeah, that's that's a challenge right now. Is is just there's no formula. There never has been ever in the film industry really. But right now. It's almost like you might as well just try and make the movies that appeal to you and your tastes and try not to count out in the market too much, but at the same time realize you still need to have these sellable elements in it or it probably won't catch the eyes of the right people. So in Clapboard Jungle, you kind of cover the struggles, um, again, that are very familiar uh, to, to many of us working in independent film. Um, and really, honestly, quite bravely putting yourself out there, I will say, um, for sure, I'm not sure, you know how you how you feel now that it's out there and over time and and going through this whole process how how you feel and how that's changed. But my question is, how do you handle? Uh, because there's a lot of rejection, right? Sure. You hear no's all of the time when you're trying to get a get a project off the ground. I'm curious, was making this documentary therapeutic was watching yourself and the struggles and I would imagine in Q and A's and events that you've had for the film hearing from many other filmmakers like myself you know I think when I saw it at Fantasia I reached out to you and I was like man yeah. this this hurts you know this is like so familiar like I it's kind of like we share you can share that kind mm-hmm. of community pain was was it for you though being the protagonist and being the one to put to put yourself out there? Yeah, was it therapeutic? Do you feel that now? Do you handle rejection a little differently after hearing from other filmmakers? Cinema Activist is produced by Lions Den Productions, hosted by John C. Lyons, music by Tony Gray. Support the efforts of Lion's Den Productions by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Lion's Den Productions. Thank you for listening. We'll be back soon.